Today we're chatting with Matias Algart, who works for the Disney Interactive Media Group in Palo Alto, California. Also joining us is a group of computer engineering students from Iowa State University. My name is Daisy Isibor, and I'm a junior in computer engineering here at Iowa State. Hi, I'm Kyle Teets, a sophomore here. I'm uh, Michael Orr, I'm a junior here. I'm Curtis Ellerick, I'm a senior in computer engineering. How about to start off, Matthias, why don't you tell us what you do at Disney? I work for Disney Interactive, and Disney Interactive is one major division underneath the, the, uh, the larger Walt Disney Company, and Disney Interactive deals with um, any online content or any uh, gaming, basically any kind of interactive technology, um, separate from like Disney's parks and all their other uh, ventures. We run a private cloud for, for Disney. Any of the the interactive technologies that need um, storage, you know, like games or mobile games, Facebook games, even console games. And my team runs a, basically a suite of services that allow you know, end users ultimately to store their, their data and be able to retrieve it as well. So our direct clients are game studios within Disney. Uh, all these different uh, game studios basically use our uh, services to store and basically relate the data that they store for their users. Um, so aside from storage, other services that we provide are like, you know, social-based services. Like you can, for any two players in a game, you can create a, you know, a relationship between them. Um, well, so you mentioned mobile games, Facebook games, console games. So it sounds like there would be a lot of different types of user data that you would have. Um, so how do you kind of deal with all those different data types? You can have different kinds of storage systems, like relational databases that are that are structured, or, or NoSQL database systems that are that are unstructured. And so our team runs a, a NoSQL uh, database system called MongoDB, and MongoDB is basically a document-oriented database. You store documents um, that you know represent your data. So some game teams store like world state for a video game. There might be like 300 kilobytes of binary data. Other teams store, you know, 10 kilobytes of, of just user data, you know, name and uh, avatar, last name, or whatever whatever it is that they want. So by, by choosing Mongo, we allow uh, our, our game studios to ultimately choose their structure. Okay. And can you describe to us maybe what a typical integration might look like, what the process would be when you're working with a, a game studio? Studios hopefully re release games pretty often, you know, once every four or six months. Um, so they have a, a definite cycle to them. In the beginning of the cycle, they'll come to us and, and basically ask for, you know, development system for them to use and prototype with. At that point, you know, we give them a specific database instance. Any kind of game will, will have what we consider like a back end. You know, for example, if you take a Facebook game, you know, th the clicks and all the interactions that they're doing with the Facebook game are all being represented as HTTP calls to uh, the game studio's backend servers. Those app servers then basically turn around and store that information and our services using uh, HTTP REST calls, you know, post, put, get, delete, that sort of thing. In general, what are some of the tools or technologies that you use? We tend to use a lot of open source uh, technologies because they tend to be a little better tested than proprietary software. A lot of times when we get into difficult production type problems, you know, like we're running a, a petabyte sized database and one shard of it is crashing or something, we see like some, some weird error message. It's very useful to be able to jump into the source code and be able to, you know, basically grab out the, the error message that you saw and basically try to figure out what's going on in there. We'll use tools like, uh, like MongoDB, which is our, our backing store. We use uh, app servers, Tomcat app servers. Um, all of our services are written in Java. We use a, a lot of Spring-based, uh, if you guys are familiar with Spring, it's just a, a Java framework. Uh, we use Spring, we use uh, Apache CXF, which is kind of a, a service routing system. You had mentioned, um, you know, problems with production, production that you run into sometimes. Yeah. What are some of the big challenges uh, that you have running this type of? Stuff? 
we do over two billion transactions uh, a day, um, and so you know we have multiple games all hitting a single uh, layer of services. When a game first starts up, and they don't really have a, a good sense of how to interact with our services, they'll 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 make poor choices in how how often they write or read data, or how much data they read. You know, they may like write in you know a, a 10 megabyte document and read it right back uh, and that basically just stalls out threads you know um, so, so they get a lot of like poor performance initially so some of the harder problems for us is debugging through that it's basically an education problem um, so, so that's mm -hmm. something we we try to do up front with like little boot camps that we run for our, our clients other real world problems um, might be more operational in nature like we have a database that's three, four terabytes big. Uh, it can't all fit into one database machine, so we have it sharded out across, um, you know, a cluster of different MongoDB. They're called shards. One classic problem is, like, you know, one of the shards is getting so much activity that it basically crashes, and um, all queries to that one shard are failing, and our customers just start kind of freaking out a little bit. And, um, trying to get that resolved and back online uh, it is usually a, a nice problem to solve. So was there a specific um, reason why you, you, um, you all chose MongoDB versus different kinds of other data, databases? So at the time, I believe that MongoDB, uh, its choice of features and specifically the, the sharding and replication features of Mongo helped kind of set it above the others. Being able to run a database as a replica set instead of just a single database allows for failover, um, and we have failover situations all the time. Um, and apart from, you know, error type situations where, like, the primary or the master fails and one of the secondary picks up and becomes a new primary, um, we can also do rolling upgrades with, with replica sets. So if we're upgrading from, you know, Mongo 2.1 to 2.5 or something, we can uh, upgrade all the secondaries first and then uh, it's called step down the, the primary, upgrade him, and then the whole thing's upgraded. Um, so you mentioned that there's a lot of data for all these different games that you guys are handling and storing in your databases. Um, do you deal with a lot of sensitive personal data, or is it mainly uh, just data related to games that sort of abstract it? It's a, it's a great question, especially for Disney, because uh, Disney has a lot of uh, kids playing video games now. We do have a lot of sensitive data. It's not it's not PII. It's not person identifiable information for the most part. But we do have some some services that you know my my larger group runs that are super sensitive and they're firewalled and they're locked up and you know access lists for everything and we're, we're very good about it. Is the data that you deal with more uh, streaming or static? Um, it's more static. So do you, do you use um, anything like Hadoop, or what? how do you manage um, everything on your cluster? Being able to scale out to the point where you can do like a billion transactions a, a day, um, those kinds of queries don't really mix well with Hadoop style, like operational reporting type queries that, that you know, program managers love to run. Like they just want to run everything and, you know, get all the stats for their game. So what we usually do is we have... Um, separate analytics machines that we periodically dump their their game data to and that they can run their, their reporting type queries on that directly. Um, so it's not real time, but it's good enough to get an idea of what they need. It sounds like you have different games pretty isolated um, as far as the, the resources that you put towards them. So how do you manage that kind of load balancing and maybe the fault tolerance that goes with that? For sure, isolating the games from each other helps a lot, uh, especially since some you know, some games are, in a sense, they kind of abuse themselves. Like, you can think of it as they're almost like denial of servicing themselves. There's always network uh, interruptions, like constantly. Classic thing to do when, when you have a network interruption is to do retries. And so, depending on your retry policy, you can completely DOS yourself. You know, if you retry within five milliseconds of your failure, you're, you're basically just going to hammer yourself to death. So after a while, we started isolating games from each other so that one game could completely go down and the rest are still up and happy. Um, so we do that through um, hardware isolation. It, it's a function of how we built our services. You know, we have a, 
we have a, a suite of services, and they're all in, you could think of it as like an app server tier. And, I, and each app server basically has a limited number of threads that it's running at any one time. Um, so if, if we ever have a game that comes in and starts running really long-running queries, you know, all those threads on that app server are going to start backing up. And uh, at that point, the, that one game is, you know, able to handle less and less. Um, so, so the way we do things, which is pretty nice, is that <clears throat> once we detect that, you know, a specific game is hammering itself, it, it's like a circuit breaker, basically. We, we stop allowing them to keep sending more queries. Um, otherwise, they would starve the threads for all the other games that are using the same application server tier. I'm wondering what sort of tools you have for like monitoring and uh, load testing and debugging performance-related things. So monitoring is probably one of the the most important services that we we offer our customers. We're providing a service for them where they can store their data, but they can't access the data base directly. So for that, we we run what what we call a log service, and logs basically capture um, varying levels of information for them that they can then view from a separate web app. You know, that's internal to Disney, of course. And then just for their one product, you know, their one database instance, they can see uh, all of the requests and, you know, volume sizes and stuff like that. Uh, that's super, super useful because then, you know, if, if there's a, a, any change in their usage, you know, we, we can go back through the logs and, and point that out, you know, through, through charts and graphs uh, where something changed or where, you know, their request volume tripled or something, and that's why their database is getting crushed. Monitoring tools, we've also um, written ourselves, you know, internal monitoring tools. The creators of MongoDB run a separate free service called uh, MMS that they basically allow you to, to view pretty detailed statistics on your instances. And it works by just having um, agents on, on your side you know, a little software Python script that uh, every once in a while pings your database, retrieves like statistics, and sends it back to uh, Tengen as the company, it's the Tengen's MMS service. And then from there, you can go and look at any of your instances and see all the information. How do you go about um, generating anomalies and looking for edge cases with systems like this since it's open to the public upon release kind of thing? MongoDB, because it's open source uh, and, and there are a lot of companies that are, are using it in production, gets a lot of uh, coverage. You know, you know, they have their own test suites and stuff like that, but they're, they're, they're kind of myopic to how, how they develop the software. Um, we have our own test suites that we run against any version. So, like, if we're thinking about upgrading to the newest version, we'll run, you know, functional tests through this new version. And then we also have, uh, you guys familiar with JMeter? So JMeter is a, a, an Apache-based load generation tool. It's, it's kind of like Apache Bench, but JMeter is a, a lot more involved. Uh, it's a really good tool to, to learn how to use. It just... You can program it to, to do whatever you want, like generate you know, a million HTTP calls in f five minutes or something. We use it all the time to, to load test our stuff. It seems there's been a lot of uh, tools and a lot of resources for uh, self-teaching and programming or uh, self-exploration or, or a lot yeah. of really personal programming projects and things like that. What are your thoughts on, on the sort of personal experience as a as a, as a supplement or a substitute for maybe more formal teaching. You constantly have to keep your, your skills fresh, and having side projects, like you mentioned, is one really good way to do it. Um, and, you know, if you, if you guys are familiar with GitHub, so, you know, you can put your, your side project up on GitHub, and aside from learning something cool that, that you're interested in, not, not just your, your company, um, doing that stuff on your own, uh, you can also then show other people your work, you know, if you choose to make it public. And that comes across as, you know, much more valuable than, than me asking you questions up on a whiteboard. Uh, just looking at your work that you published, I can, I can tell, like, how you program. And there's so many different ways to learn, uh, you know, very useful skills, like Coursera, for example. You can go and, and learn machine learning from, you know, from Stanford now. On a different note, I'm curious as to what the work environment's like uh, being at Disney. Disney, 
let's say this office specifically uh, in Palo Alto was was recently formed like within the last two years and, and I started it up like a year and a half ago so um, most of the people in this office were were part of a, a smaller company called Playdom and Playdom was basically a you know a social game startup company and so they very much had a, a, a startup culture you know my first day on the job I looked you know in one corner of the office had like a drum set you know, an actual drum set that people would play once in a while, like in the middle of work. Um, and so, you know, with the Disney acquisition, stuff changed, but still here, like, you know, also being part of Silicon Valley, the um, the work culture is very laid back. Um, and like like I said, it's a, it's a completely open floor plan, which is makes for a very different kind of work experience. In our office, you know, we all sit on, like I, told, like I said before, one big desk with a bunch of different computers. Um, you know, no one has a specific cube or anything. And so when we're interacting, like, you know, something, we're having a problem or something, we can all hear each other talk and, you know, share ideas or stuff like that, like, in instantly. What type of skills or uh, qualities you might look for in a potential candidate? We look for people, basically, that, that have the technical programming skills. We also expect people to be very good communication-wise, because uh, that's a major function of what we do. Is you know, for example, being being able to explain your 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 design to a group of people, uh, be able to justify you know the decisions you made in your design. Thank you. Good luck, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah.